Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the Open Ended Evolution Workshop. I'm really glad to see you all here. Um, it is going to be a very exciting session. It's going to be um, a very sort of fast paced session if you've looked at the schedule. So, what I'm going to do just now is hand over to Mark, um, who uh, it was really his original idea to have this session and to um, his idea of the organisation. So, Mark's going to explain a bit about that. Then, I will say a few words about practicalities and then I'll hand over to Alistair, the other um, organiser, who will also say a few words about um, practicalities of the session. And then we will get straight into the talks. So, Mark. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, first of all, welcome all of you. Uh, happy to be here with you to talk about this very interesting question of open ended evolution. The, I wanted to set a larger context here, just very, very briefly. I say briefly because I want to let all the speakers know that, as Tim was saying, the schedule is extremely tight. There's 10 minutes from the moment you stand up from the chair to the moment Alistair is going to put his arms around you and drag you <laughs> off the stage. And so, um, sorry, you just need to be uh, draconian about it cause, uh, so that we'll be able to get the coffee break and lunch. Um, the goal for today is to have a quick uh, review of the state of the art according to uh, about open-ended evolution or particular pieces of the, the state of the art from people in this in this community um, focusing on what concepts of artificial life they're interested in studying how could you operationalize these things what models might exhibit these uh, properties or would be good to test these what natural systems should we study and what kind of empirical results do we actually have at this point that we can step on and build on, um, and what are the key milestones for making progress in, in the future. And in particular, and I'm thinking about the future, we'll have in mind next year, a year from now, at the A-Life meeting in Mexico, uh, in Cancun, if you're not, if you haven't heard about that, I uh, hope you consider going there, where there will be a follow-up, the plan is to have a follow-up workshop on this one, which would be, uh, be able to build on the, the work that we've done here. Um, the, um, the, way, the one further thing that I wanted to briefly mention is there's an online document, a Google document, which is uh, anyone here can get access to through Tim if you don't already have access to it, so you can edit it. And the goal is during the, well, there are sections of that document corresponding to each of those issues I just raised. What are the key concepts? What are the uh, key models, etc. cetera? Um, and what we want to do is have people, but well, we are inviting all of you to add information to that document during ECAL. And then on Friday, there's a, at the very end of the session, there's another meeting of this workshop where we will go over those results, discuss them in a preliminary way, and then uh, make final plans for the workshop in a year. <clears throat> Our plan is, assuming the document is, is uh, uh, good and interesting, is to publish that as a, probably as a report in the Artificial Life Journal, and if you'd like to be, well, if you help edit the document and contribute ideas, then you'll be one of the co-authors. So if that's interesting to you, just want to let you know that there's that opportunity. So let me just get off the stage now and turn things over again to Alistair to say a couple other brief remarks. Uh, just very briefly then, um, we really do want everyone to please add your perspectives to that document. It's one of the main outcomes that will come out of this workshop. Uh, we had a chat yesterday about how on earth we keep everyone's time. So what we agreed was, um, if you can finish your talk within eight minutes, then we'll have time for one question. Otherwise, we'll just move on, and there'll be time in the lunch. Okay, thanks. Okay, a couple more words of um, practicalities. Um, so right, Mark's already mentioned the Google Docs. If you haven't registered to edit that, uh, just talk to me, and I can add your email address so you can edit it. Um, just practicality. This event is being filmed um, on request and audio and video. Um, the camera is obviously there. It's got a fairly um, small field of view, so it um, stretches from the end of the screen to around about here. So if you can stay in this region whilst you're talking, that would be great. Um, and then finally, because it's such, going to be such a rushed session, um, we thought it would be a nice idea for a, to have the opportunity to meet up um, this evening and continue discussions more informally. Um, to that end, there's a suggestion that we meet in the atrium 
um, downstairs um, before six o'clock, and then at six o'clock we will walk into the village, which is about ten minutes walk away, and there's a big pub there, um, and we can go and have some more informal discussions. So anyone who would like to join us for that, please be in the atrium uh, for six o'clock. Right. So I think we're already um, ahead of schedule, which is good. Um, Mark, is there anything else to add at this stage? No. Uh, in fact, we were trying to get through the intros really quickly because the schedule's so tight, so why don't we just start with the sure. first one? Yeah, so uh, anyone who submitted their, um, their uh, presentations, they are loaded up here. So Barry is first off. Um, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Uh, my time is ticking, so we'll see if we can actually do this. So, morning, everybody. You're very welcome. Uh, skip all that. Don't have time. Um, <laughs> Karl Popper, my personal favourite philosopher of the last century, um, he's not very commonly cited. Uh, generally, actually, but certainly not in the artificial life world, which I find a little bit peculiar, and particularly in the context of open-ended evolution, because of 20th century philosophy and philosophers, Popper was particularly uncompromising in his commitment to the idea of an open universe, and in fact, the third volume of his infamous <coughs> postscript, the logic of scientific uh, discovery is called the open universe, in which he argues tensionly for genuine openness in the universe. Uh, and, and the core of that argument is that unless that's the case, there's no such thing as moral choice or moral, moral behavior. Now, that doesn't mean the universe has to be open, but it's an interesting tension. However, that's not today's talk, so I'm not going to talk about that. But as I say, it just highlights uh, you know, the strange absence of discussion of Popper's philosophy in context of uh, open-ended evolution. His entire philosophical system was built on evolutionary theory. Uh, this volume, Objective Knowledge and Evolutionary Approach, pulled together a lot of his writings about his theory of knowledge, or what we now call evolutionary epistemology, as the growth of knowledge as being an evolutionary process, analogous to, but uh, in other ways, very different from biological evolution. Uh, so this is in the introduction. Human knowledge is no doubt the greatest miracle in our universe. It constitutes a problem that will not soon be solved. But I hope that I have started to restart a discussion which for three centuries has been bogged down in preliminaries. I won't say that the discussion of open-ended evolution has been bogged down for three centuries, but I think it has been bogged down for a little while. Uh, some of us in the room have been talking about open-ended evolution for some time, and I certainly at times felt like it was a little bit bogged down. Uh, I'm basically going to take some work uh, that Popper published a long time ago and just represent it to you. It's not original to me, but I think uh, it's a tiny little idea that may add some extra uh, angle for discussion uh, in our workshop uh, today. Okay. Um, so this is where it's from. Uh, it's a chapter from that book, uh, Objective Knowledge, Evolution and the Tree of Knowledge. Uh, I just point out that it's based on a lecture recently delivered in October 1961. Um, with an addendum in 1971, which is where the behavioral monster bit came from. Um, I think that's interesting. Cast your mind back to 1961. It's only 16 years after the Second World War. Uh, molecular biology has hard, hardly started. Uh, we know the structure of DNA, but we don't know an awful lot more than that. Von Neumann died four years earlier. Uh, theory of self-reproducing automata won't be published for another five years. It's a different world. We don't have computers in the sense in which we understand them. Uh, and yet I'm going to try to persuade you that there's something in here that's relevant to artificial life and to open-ended evolution. He says the problem to be solved in this paper is the old problem of orthogenesis or directed evolution versus accidental independent mutation. Samuel Butler's problem of luck or cunning it arises from the difficulty of understanding how a complicated <coughs> organ such as the eye can ever result from purely accidental cooperation and independent mutations. Is that a problem anymore? Uh, and again, you may tell me before we're finished that it's not. Um, most evolutionary biologists think this is all done and dusted. You just have to appeal to things like pre-adaptation or ex-adaptation, and that solves it. And maybe what I'm going to describe here is just that. 
I'm going to suggest that maybe it's a little bit more than that, but that's part of the discussion. Okay, back to the future. It's 1961, folks. Okay, that, for those of you who are into these sorts of things, is, maybe, I don't know, is a HQ-9 from General Atomics, uh, unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV, or drone. Okay. It can actually operate under remote control, but it can actually operate autonomously, without any remote pilots. Or not, folks. Popper, writing in 1961 or speaking in 1961, says, I take as my model an airplane, for example, a fighter plane steered by an automatic pilot. The airplane, we assume, is built for certain definite purposes, and the automatic pilot is furnished with a number of inbuilt reactions, which amount to instructions to attack a weaker enemy, to support a friend in attack or defense, to flee from a stronger enemy, and so on. So you could conceive already at that time that such a thing is perfectly possible. If we look inside the box, almost certainly it has what we would now call a hierarchical control system. Hierarchy, I think, is a thing that we walk over and over again today. Um, the mechanical parts of the automatic pilot, upon which these instructions depend, constitute the physical basis of what we call the aim structure. Okay, what is the thing, what is the, the plane trying to do? What are its aims? In addition, there's what uh, Popper calls its skill structure. Stabilization mechanism, steering controls, aiming controls, so this hierarchy with the aim structure at the top and the skill structure. Together, the aim structure and skill structure constitute what I propose to call the central propensity structure of the automatic pilot, or if you will, its mind. Okay. So he's already taught, so this is artificial life, folks. Well, uh, this is my ticket into the conference. Um, now, settling into the armchair, uh, many people are critical of armchair philosophers and thought experiments, but that's what Popper does next. Okay? And he defends it, incidentally. He says, lots of good things can be done just by sitting in your armchair and thinking about things. Um, let us now assume, <coughs> the HQ-9, unfortunately, that doesn't exactly happen this way, but let us assume that our fighter aircraft is reproducible. It doesn't matter whether it's self-reproducing or it's reproduced by a factory copying its various physical parts, from a genome or otherwise. Those subject to accidental mutation, so there has to be some inheritance mechanism. Okay. Then we show, throw the usual spanner in the works, uh, as a particular spanner in this case. Let's say a mutation gives all the engines greater power. That sounds good. So the plane can fly faster. It must be considered favorable both for attacking the enemy and for fleeing. And we can assume that its aim structure will induce the automatic pilot to make full use of the increased power and speed except that its skill structure will be adjusted to the old engine at top speed. The speed will be too fast for us, and the plane will crash. Okay, this is almost inevitably what's going to happen. However, if we pause on this trivial example for a second and think about, well, what if it was the other way around? What if the skill structure mutated first so that it could handle higher speed? There's no higher speed available for it to handle, but if it mutated in such a way that it would be able to handle that, then if subsequently, okay, the engines actually, the mutation affects the engines to make them run faster, then now that will be used. So this is like a classic exaptation, a pre-adaptation. Okay? So far, so good. But can, is there any more to this than that? Well, I'm putting a long story short here. It's a long paper, folks. So I'm going to jump to the main result, uh, which we can talk about later. The main result is this, it's particularly in context of a hierarchical system of this sort. Once a new aim, sorry, that's my big note. Um, once a new aim or tendency or disposition or new skill or new way of behaving has evolved in the central propensity structure, this fact will influence the effects of natural selection in such a way that previously unfavorable though potentially favorable mutations become actually favorable. This means that the evolution of the executive organs will become directed so when you've got a hierarchical system, okay, basically if you change what you're trying to do, you may not be able to do it yet, but subsequent mutations that help you go in that direction will be favored. So you now get a trend in evolution that previously wasn't available. Okay, but it can only happen <coughs> if you change what your, your idea, your concept, your aim, your objective first. Okay. Parting thoughts, this is Popper's standard model for the evolution of knowledge. We start uh, with a problem, we formulate a tent of theory, uh, we eliminate errors, and that leaves us in a new problem situation. So in relation to this particular idea that he presented in that paper, uh, he said in particular, 
have to be critically examined from the point of view of whether it's consistent, whether it would solve the problems it set out to solve. Does it doesn't add anything beyond exaptation? Uh, at the moment, he offered it, and I offered it, as no more than a possible line of thought for today and for the workshop. But of course, that simple schema is not just one problem, one theory, one new problem situation. Like real evolution that diversifies, so I leave you, and this is my last slide, this is from four and a half thousand years ago. Uh, it's from a Neolithic tomb uh, north of Dublin called Newgrange. And those are the spirals of open-ended evolution, I ask you to believe. Thank you very much. <laughs>
very simple type of novelty, which is um, a variation within a model. That is, if you think of a mutation of uh, typical type, uh, let's say uh, you, you just change the allele of a gene, that would be typically uh, uh, a novelty within uh, a model. Um, and then you have change of the model, probably that's the second type of uh, novelty we, we defined. Uh, a change of the model, if you have, for example, uh, an, uh, again, in, in the biological realm of genes, if you have uh, gene duplication, you have a new dimension that's added to the model, and the model being, in this case, sort of something that produces the organism. And finally, sorry about that. I'm trying to transfer it. Uh, yeah. And finally, we have a type 3 uh, sort of novelty, which would be um, a <coughs> change of the model by, for example, adding a new level to the description of uh, what we want to describe. Um, and that would be, for example, so that would be a change in the model that describes the model, which we call a meta model. Um, and so you, you move from um, a very simple uh, variation within the uh, model to something that changes completely the layout of the model. And th those were the, uh, uh, the types that we sort of identified and we think they have um, uh, a bearing on open-endedness. Um, well, that was intended to be shown to you for a moment, but um, uh, let me comment on something else that uh, adds to what we <coughs> discussed last year. Actually, we are currently writing up, we're still in the draft version of our paper on, that, on the results of that workshop. Um, we're trying to write this up and um, have a kind of a, a journal article out of it. This again? No. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's fine. Um, but um, let me add one aspect that I uh, wanted to bring to you today for this workshop, namely um, the um, um, question of um, of the well. There's this definition of of, uh, of open-endedness relating to. Um, the question of is it unbounded novelty or is it unbounded complexity? And um, some people define it by use of complexity, some other people by use of, uh, of novelty. Um, and if you look at hierarchical structures where you have uh, increasing uh, sort of combinatorial spaces, the higher you go in the, um, in the levels of uh, such structures, then you could say perhaps if you if, if if you look at one particular level of of your hierarchy, then the amount of novelty at that level will be limited. So it's not unbound. It's limited uh, in terms of um, you can count all the combinatorial possibilities, and at some point you will be uh, finished counting, and you will have enumerated everything. Um, and so, in a sense, on a certain level of your the hierarchical system, you have bounded novelty. It's, it's sort of limited. But if you allow complexity to grow, then there's a way out of this. At least uh, um, uh, if, if you have exhausted your, your, your novelty. And this, um, uh, so in a way, uh, you might argue that uh, you need actually the possibility to grow complexity, to get to unbounded novelty, to get to open-ended evolution. Um, however, uh, you might retreat to the point of view that you say, okay, this is true, but uh, our universe is limited, and because of that, uh, there will be unexhaustible novelty even without uh, a continuous increase in the number of layers <laughs> or in complexity, because um, we can't even exhaust uh, certain layers because of the limit in measure and energy and time in the universe. So um, <coughs> for me, therefore, um, open-endedness doesn't require unbounded complexity. Um, it is sufficient um, to have uh, unbounded novelty. Um, okay. That was a thought that I had. And finally, what's the driving force for open-ended evolution? 
Um, to me, um, natural selection is very, very uh, a key to that. Um, and I take the, uh, the, the notion of um, natural selection that has been recently uh, sort of emphasized by Henry Cohen, who, uh, who clearly uh, separates two aspects of natural selection, one being uh, exponential growth, amplification, the other being uh, competition due to resource constraints. These two tendencies have to work together. And for me, um, if you look at, um, if you look at uh, these layered structures where uh, you can see that um, if you go to a higher level of hierarchy, you generally have uh, an exponential growth in possibilities of, uh, of entities at that higher level. Because of that, it, it seems to me somewhat, um, at least metaphorically, equivalent to uh, the amplification process of, uh, of, uh, of natural selection. So, in other words, you can really push up the, um, um, the, the number of uh, uh, possibilities at these higher levels. and. Um, there is another tendency in our world, of course, due to limited uh, resources, um, that it means you cannot go up to a very much higher number, of, a large number of, uh, of these layers because of the explosion in the number of possibilities, which mean nothing would essentially be realized. So what we need to have is we need to have still um, these layers of our hierarchy in our systems being populated by, by magic or by, by entities, otherwise uh, we would not be able to, uh, uh, to see the system working. In other words, we need, and, and that is sort of the second part of this natural, uh, natural selection within, um, uh, within open entities. That's my few thoughts. Sorry about my missing uh, projection. Um. Yeah, we're also sorry about this. Uh, we'll try to get this figured out, but uh, if speakers have their presentations and uh, during the coffee break, speakers after the coffee break could put them on this uh, this machine that would help this problem in case we're not able to sell it. So uh, a, a PDF is the preferred it looks like it. P yeah, PDF is certainly the it's safest the option. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, good. Well, maybe I'll ask you one question if I, if I may. Um, I thought it was very useful for you to distinguish different kinds of open-endedness, different kinds of novelty. And I just wanted to uh, see whether you agree with the following thing. My, my sense is that we shouldn't try to define one kind of open-ended evolution. There isn't a monolithic target. Open-ended evolution, the title of this subject, of this conference, they're at this workshop. There are a variety of concepts, and I think what we should do is just precisely specify the different ones and see which ones are useful for which purposes. Do, I fully agree. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fully. So, so there's lots of space for, uh, for thinking about this. Great. Thank you. Um, so you all see what we mean by this time compression uh, for the speakers, and uh, I guess the only saving thing I can say is that we're all suffering together. So, <laughs> the next one who's going to suffer is Tim Taylor. Okay. <coughs> okay, so what I'm going to talk about is um, my attempts over the last few years to try and get some organization into um, the concept of open ended evolution. There are a lot of different ideas and concepts involved, and I've been trying to sort of get my head around how they all fit together. So um, just starting off initially, just to um, offer my informal definition, it's very informal of what open-ended evolution is, um, evolutionary dynamics in which new, surprising, and sometimes more complex organisms and interactions continue to appear. Even more informally, I do really like this, and it's not mine. I, I don't know who originally said this, but um, a system where the continued evolution of novel forms it's so interesting that the researcher is unwilling to press the off switch. And I think that is really the, um, the holy grail of artificial life, open-ended evolution. So, 
there are lots of concepts um, in the literature which could be relevant to open-ended evolution. Um, there are just some of them. Um, I see people try to turn their heads around, but I'm not going to dwell on that. Just the point is that there's a lot of different concepts involved. Um, I spent last year in Monash University in Australia and tried to create a mind map of um, some of these concepts. I don't expect you to be able to read that, but just to make the point that my initial attempts at organising things weren't um, too successful in, in, in producing clarity. So what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, five minutes is essentially five sort of high level features that I think an artificial system must have it, it's to exhibit open-ended evolution. And I do this both for um, looking at other uh, previous systems in the past and sort of evaluating what's good and what's missing from those systems and also obviously to direct the design of um, further new systems. First of all, we need robustly reproductive individuals. Um, so here I'm talking about robustness of ecological individuals rather than populations. Um, so to make the point, von Neumann's self-reproducing cellular automata had some very nice um, evolutionary potential. But they were not robust because um, as they were reproducing, any perturbation in the cellular automata would very easily disrupt them and um, lead to, to their decay. So even though they had these nice properties from an evolutionary, a practical evolutionary point of view, they're really non-starters because they would very easily be perturbed. Tierra and Avida essentially hardwire robustness into the system. So they, they've placed very strict controls over the read and write access to, um, to other individuals in the system. That is one reason why Tierra was so much more successful than Core Wars, for example. Um, but having this hardwired limitation about what you can and can't do to your neighbor really limits the evolutionary potential of the system. So a big question for future research is, what are the appropriate ways to achieve robustness in artificial life systems? Okay, so we've got our robust in reproducing individuals. For open-ended evolution, where there's a potential of more complex things arriving, some individuals need to be able to produce more complex offspring. This could be achieved in at least two different ways. Um, the most straightforward is that a single individual is capable of producing offspring of greater complexity than itself. Now that, of course, is exactly the problem that von Neumann was addressing. Um, and essentially, his, the, the core of his solution was to have a system where the genetic code is, is treated in two ways. One, interpreted as instructions, um, and secondly, uninterpreted and copied from parents to offspring. So, seen in that sort of general way, you could say that Tierra actually implements that um, architecture because the, the programs in Tierra, they get executed by the virtual CPU and then they're copied um, uninterpreted to a new part of memory. However, of course, in Tierra, the interpretation machinery, the virtual CPU, is hard-coded and not evolvable. And so, again, that creates uh, limits on, on the evolutionary potential of that system. So we want to be able to evolve all aspects of this system, the, the interpretation machinery, genetic transmission, organization of the genome, mutation rates, the evolution of evolution <coughs> is a term that some people are using these days. Um, just to point out that there are other ways in which uh, organisms can produce more complex offspring. So two or more individuals could jointly come together and produce uh, an offspring that is more complex than any of the individual parents in processes such as horizontal gene transfer and symbiogenesis. And those kinds of things have received much less um, attention in the ALOV literature. Right, so we've got our robust individuals, <coughs> some individuals capable of producing more complex offspring. But on top of that, the mutational structure of the search space needs to be such that there are mutational pathways, often from one individual, individual to another viable individual. This has been recognized for a long time. Um, Bernd Wrench's classic um, evolution above the species level, 1947, talks about improvements allowing further improvements. Um, and there's a whole load of 
very relevant uh, recent work in this in the literature on this topic, um, <coughs> such as neutral networks, genotype networks, evolvable gene site phenotype mappings, facilitated variation, um, and many of these works sort of zero in on sort of modular, loosely coupled, nearly decomposable systems as a suitable substrate upon which to achieve these sorts of dynamics. Um, exaptation, as Wolfgang was talking about, um, or Barry, um, extra dimensional passes, uh, bypasses. So, so we've got our robust individuals, they can reproduce uh, possibly more complex things, and now we've got mutational pathways so they can actually move from, from one interesting organization to another. Now, on top of all this, um, what about the environment? <coughs> what processes, what properties of the environment do we want? Um, well, I think that we want complex environments um, because without complex environments, just having evolution of the organisms themselves um, is pretty boring. Um, the, so the so ALAF pioneer Neil Sparicelli in the 1950s recognized this and he spoke about his, his little organisms would never be, be anything more than just plain numbers unless he used the term toy bricks, unless they had some toy bricks in the environment which they could utilize, make use of and incorporate into their phenotype. Um, so the question is what, are, what features of the environment are required for allowing organisms to tap into the complexity of the environment. And so this isn't just about increased computational or information processing capabilities, but it's also, also relevant is how to evolve new sensors and effectors, so how to interact with the dynamics of the, of the environment in new ways. Um, and also, um, as Wolfgang was talking about, new organizations, hierarchy. So we want all of these things to be able to evolve. Um, but the question is how to design a system in which the organisms can evolve uh, to make use of that complexity. Okay, so we've got robust reproducing individuals. Uh, some that they can possibly create more complex um, offspring. Uh, they are um, <laughs> mutational pathways, that's right. Um, so that they can actually move in the mutational space from from one individual to another.